Are you sure we should do this? Heather gave me a playful but firm punch on the shoulder. You said it yourself. That report looked real sketchy. There's definitely something going on. She looked out the windshield to the sprawling lawn ahead. Besides, even if I were wrong, what's the worst that could happen? Make if he kicks us out of his house? I nodded, but grimaced. I drove up the driveway, which was long and lined with trees. All the greenery leading up to the house was impressive, actually. The other yards on the nearby streets had been respectable, but everything here had a sort of vibrance that the others lacked. The grass and leaves were so green, and as we neared the house, I could see that the hydrangeas were in bloom. Each were vibrant pinks and purples, and appeared meticulously taken care of, not a single wilted petal on any of the plants. We got out of the car and took in the fresh air. Even the breeze smelled sweeter here. As soon as we had rounded the corner to Rhodes Creek, the drops had stopped. But it didn't even have that musty after-rain scent. The water that remained gave everything the glistening effect of dew and sunlight. This place is great, Heather said, taking in the view. I nodded in agreement. The house was stark white against the blue sky. It was one of those Tudor-style homes with sharp points of gabled roof and a tall, stacked chimney rising on the side. I was nervous, but I walked with Heather up the sidewalk. I was thinking about what I was going to say, trying to arrange my exact words in my head, but something was distracting me. The hydrangeas. They were perfect. Like, like I had first thought when we drove up, but up close. There was something not quite right about them. In school, we learned about the basics of thermodynamics. The first law is simple. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Almost like saying, we have to work with what we've got. But the second law is the one that really screws us. Entropy. Over time, everything is working towards chaos. My science teacher used to tell it to us like this. If you left a wooden shed alone in the woods for 100 years, it would begin to decay. The wood would rot and splinter. Ivy would force itself between the planks until eventually. All that's left is a pile of rubble. Without you ever laying a finger on it. Everything in nature is constantly working towards its own destruction, no matter what. And yet, these hydrangeas, there wasn't a single imperfection among them. No browning ends to petals, no stems that refuse to bloom, no bite marks from hungry caterpillars, and the smell, though subtle and pleasant on the breeze, was strange at this short distance. It was almost too strong, too concentrated. Smelled like flowers, but in the way a banana-flavored candy tastes like banana. I walked over to one of the trees by the driveway. What are you doing? Heather asked, still halfway to the door. I reached out a hand and touched the bark before quickly pulling it back. I crouched down to the grass at my feet and tugged on a few blades. They stayed put. I walked back over to Heather. <laughs> what was that? She half laughed. I think you're right, I said a bit breathlessly. I think there's something strange going on here. I motioned to the flowers in front of us. They're all fake. Heather scoffed at first, but then I didn't return her smile. She leaned forward and felt for herself. They were high quality, to be sure, but there was no mistaking it. Nothing around here was alive. It was all synthetic, plastic, or something similar. What the hell? She said under her breath. Then taking a few steps into the flower bed, she leaned a cluster of flowers towards me. Look. Nestled in the blooms was a tiny bumblebee. The rump half, dusted with pollen. Slowly, Heather raised her hand and gently rubbed her finger against the insect's wings. Nothing. It didn't fly. It didn't even crawl. Amazing, isn't it? Heather straightened up quickly. They both turned to see a man standing behind us. Though he was in reality 50 years old, he looked much younger. 
His skin was gently tanned, and his build was athletic. His hair was combed to the side, not a stray hair out of place. He wore pants ironed to perfection, and a button-up shirt that was just as prim. He smiled at us. His teeth were so white they almost glowed, and his skin didn't crease around his wide blue eyes. So blue, he might have been wearing colored contacts. Sorry, I said quickly, reaching out my hand. I'm Samuel Singer. This is, uh, Heather Dyer. I cleared my throat. This was always the part that chased people away. We're with the Moonlight Gazette. He smiled, but he only looked at my outstretched hand. A member of the press, he said through clenched teeth. Hardly, Heather spoke up beside me, much to my relief. We're from Habitsville, which is small enough, but we aren't even the biggest news outlet in town. She tried for an easygoing smile. Besides, you know how print media is these days. He kept smiling. No, I don't. Heather's expression faltered. It's, uh, not doing well. Oh, the man said, and his smile immediately dropped to a frown. His eyebrows, which had been slightly raised in excitement, instead furrowed inward. He looked like someone trying to make the expression that means sadness without feeling any actual pity in reality. I'm sorry. Th that's why we're here, I jumped in. We're hoping that we could talk to Tom McAfee. We wanted to do a feature on him for our column in the moonlight. As soon as I said this, the man's expression shifted back to that same smile he had began with, like someone had switched a flip. You're in luck. I'm Tommy McAfee, he said brightly, and my heart sank. I was hoping he wasn't. Let's go inside and talk. Then he turned on his heels and began walking up the sidewalk and towards the door. Heather and I exchanged the same uneasy glances, but neither of us turned back. Is it about the garden? Excuse me? Tommy stopped walking and turned back around. Your story! It's about my garden, correct? I saw you two admiring it. A completely perfect, pristine, artificial landscape. No allergies, no pests. Paradise. He gazed around at his flowers. My parents made it. It's one of the few things I have left of them. It's lovely, Heather said politely. Thank you, he answered. Now come inside. We can talk more about it. You can take a tour of the greenhouse, too. He started to turn away, but my voice stopped him. Oh, I started, unsure of how to proceed. It's really impeccable for sure, but that's not what we wanted to talk about. Tom McAfee stopped, but kept smiling at us both. He didn't say anything. We wanted to talk to you about 1980, Heather said quickly, verbally ripping off the band-aid. It was a strange thing to watch. Tom McAfee's face, he, his plastered-on smile fell, but only for a fraction of a second. His mouth flatlined, his two blue eyes blinked, and then he had regained his composure. Huh, he said calmly. He looked at Heather more intently than before, then turned towards me. We met eyes only for a moment, before I had to look away from his intense gaze. Good. I hadn't expected him to say that. I also didn't expect him to turn once again and continue to walk towards the front door. But that was what he did, and Heather and I followed, thinking that this meeting was going to be better than we had hoped. In reality, it was going much, much worse. I had told Heather that she had been right, that there was something strange going on at Tom and McAfee's house, but she had been wrong, too. Heather said the worst thing that could happen would be that Tommy McAfee would kick us out of his house before we could get to the story. But that wasn't true. The worst thing that could happen is that Tommy McAfee wouldn't let us leave. Have you ever made a decision and almost in the very same moment deeply regretted it? That's how I felt after I first stepped into the McAfee house. The same sickly sweet smell of the synthetic hydrangeas drifted in with us, but that wasn't the only problem. Heather stiffened behind me, and I knew she felt it too, and the worst part was the house itself was fine. It was painted a cool, crisp, light blue. The white molding and wide windows made it feel airy and open, not the least claustrophobic. It was still sunny outside, and the beams streamed in and onto the wooden floor, though the house wasn't inherently creepy on its own. Someone had made it that way. 
Let's sit in the parlor, shall we? Tommy said, a casual hum to his voice as he led us. The parlor is where things became problematic. The furniture itself was again fine, a gray sofa that appeared new, two cream armchairs that looked the same. There was a fireplace that was spotless, devoid of ash or wood, above it a strange oil painting, a still life I couldn't quite make out. On the opposite wall, a large framed mirror. But the devil was in the details. I'm no interior decorator by any means, but it looked like the two drastically different styles were at war with one another in this room. The clean, plain, classic look of the furniture and the, well, demented quality of the accessories. Every surface that could be covered with a doily was, but not the thin, parched white lace of a family heirloom. It was messy, concocted, most not in complete circles, some with huge gaping holes made in them. They hung off the sides of the tables, few nearly sweeping the floor. They were all different colors and materials, and the overall effect was, well, disconcerting. Deep navy blue curtains hung, pressed from either side of the windows. They had been ironed and had not a speck of lint on them, but for whatever reason, it looked like someone had cut out large squares of the navy and sewn in jaggedly cut shapes of completely different fabrics. Some were checkered, some plaid, some striped, and all were loud, bright colors. Lots of orange and purple, and each were messily sewn into place with thick red yarn. I was trying not to stare around the room, especially because I was intensely aware of Heather openly ogling her surroundings from where she stood next to me. You have a really nice house, I said gently. Oh, yeah, very nice, Heather said absentmindedly. Tommy smiled brightly at us. Please, sit, he said, and motioned to the sofa. He sat in one of the armchairs, and I could see they too had been given a similar patchwork job as the curtains. The sofa, on the other hand, had a large tear that went across nearly the entire length of the sitting portion, like someone had raked a knife across it, then it had been messily mended, haphazardly sewn back together with the same thick red yarn. To say I was uneasy would be an understatement, but Heather sat, so I did too. Tommy stared at us for a moment, and we stared back. Then, just as I was about to break the silence, Tommy did it for me by abruptly getting to his feet. Would anyone like some coffee? The sweet smell, plus my own nerves, was making my stomach turn. No thank you, I said, but Heather perked up. I'd love some, if it isn't too much trouble, she said politely. I tried to give her a nudge with my leg, a sort of, I don't want to be here for too long nudge, but if she understood, she ignored it. The ride here was sort of long, and I could use a pick-me-up. I suppressed my frown. I had come to Rhodes Creek from Habitsville, but I had picked up Heather only about 15 minutes from the McAfee house. She had been finishing up an interview for another story that she had been working on, and had agreed to help me with the column because, well... She'd already be in the area. Tommy's smile, if possible, got wider. No trouble at all. I was going to make myself a cup anyway. He walked towards the doorway. Be right back, he said, before disappearing around the corner. It sounded vaguely like a threat, but I blamed that on my own uneasiness. What are you doing? I said to Heather in a hushed whisper. Don't drag this out. This place is creepy. Let's just get the story. Get out. There was an urgency in my voice, but Heather didn't look like she was paying attention. Instead, she was staring at the fireplace. Then, wordlessly, she rose up and strode over to it. I wanted you to take a look at this. She motioned to the oil painting that hung on the wall. I looked back at the doorway to make sure that Tommy was still away. I had no idea how far away the kitchen was, but I somehow knew that letting him catch us examining his house any closer than we needed to would not be a good idea. I stood beside Heather and looked at the painting. What am I looking at? I asked. The paint was put on thick, and smattering in gray and blue and white. I'd never been much of an art critic either. It's the parlor, Heather said, and as soon as she said it, I could see it. The sofa where we had been sitting, the armchairs, the fireplace, and even painted above it, the very painting we were looking at. The only difference? Everything was on the wrong side. 
The sofas were on the left instead of the right. The armchair was the opposite. And another difference. There was something on the sofa. It was undefined, a smudge of lavender in the center, and lines that resembled arms and legs. I couldn't tell what it was, and yet a shiver ran down my spine. I shook my head. That's weird. You're right, I said. Weird is good. Weird is why we're here. Then Heather moved back towards the sofa and sat down, right in the center. What are you doing? I asked. Leave some room for me. She wasn't listening, although this time she was staring at the opposite wall. The one with a mirror. She looked for a second, then stood up quickly. She grabbed me by the shoulder and shoved me into the exact spot where she had sat. I gave a grunt, but before I could protest, she pointed at the mirror. Now look at the mirror. I did. And at first I was confused. I saw myself, I saw the sofa, the chairs... Oh, I said, and Heather smiled. Oh. The painting, for whatever reason, was the exact view that a person sitting in the center of the sofa would have, if they were looking at the parlor through the mirror. What is that? I started, not entirely sure of where my question was headed, but I was cut off. Footsteps were approaching, but they weren't human. I tensed at first until I'd recognized the noise, the soft, padded feet and swaying walk of a cat. And then it appeared, through the doorway. It was long and lean. It was a cream color, like the armchairs, and thick white fur around its chest. Its paws were bright white, little tiny gloves. I could see the white fluff extended down its stomach, making it look plumper than it probably really was. A sigh of relief went through me. I didn't mind cats. This was fine. I moved over on the sofa, and Heather sat back down beside me, both of us intrigued by the visitor. Its eyes were a bit concerning. They were dark, probably brown. But they looked black and blended in with the pupils. It sat down after walking a few steps into the room and stared at us. Not in the distracted manner an animal stares at another animal. It seemed strangely... intelligent. Come here, kitty, Heather cooed at it snapping her fingers lightly as she leaned towards the cat. And to my surprise, it came. It rubbed against her legs and gracefully accepted her hands on its fur. Pet the cat, Sam. It's sweet, she said teasingly, but I didn't. If I had felt queasy before, the oil painting had me feeling absolutely ill. I shook my head, but Heather insisted. Before I could stop her, she picked up the cat and put it on my lap. No, I... I started, instinctively holding the cat around the middle. As I did, I quickly jerked my hand away. The cat slid out of my lap and trotted towards the door. It disappeared, and I turned to Heather. I swear, I just, I just felt... Before I could finish, we heard footsteps. This time, heavy and decidedly human. It was Tommy with two cups of coffee on small plates on either hand. As always, he was smiling. Heather and I both smiled weakly back. Now, he said brightly. Where do we begin? Now that we were inside the house and Heather and Tommy had their coffee, I knew it was time for the interview. This was what I had come for, and I knew I was potentially about to get answers to questions posed decades ago. But I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was completely certain I had felt a zipper on that cat's stomach. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify, or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube, or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. I just want to remind all of you that if you're on a cold autumn night and you need a warm drink, then my wife sells tea. There's tea available at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. All different kinds, including those themed off of creepypastas, horror icons, horror monsters, and Dungeons and Dragons. And if you order that creepypasta set with the Mr. Creepypasta's Dark and Stormy Night, the actual tea that I drink while recording these 
stories, uh, well, probably about 60% of the time, then you can always ask for that MCP dabbing sticker instead of the classic channel icon sticker. And I get a kick out of it every time someone asks her to do that. Also, I wanted to say thank you, all of you, who are supporting me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta, and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Anne Charan, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching, thank you all for listening, and I hope you all have a wonderfully happy Halloween. Sweet dreams. <laughs>